Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean of the USC Seoul Prize School of Public Policy, Jack Knott. Well, welcome everyone to this afternoon's session. As Dean of the USC Seoul Prize School of Public Policy and the home of the Schwarzenegger Institute, I'm really gratified uh, to see such extraordinary panelists that we've had so far today and also this afternoon, and also very pleased uh, with the large attendance at our first inaugural event of the Schwarzenegger Institute. Let me thank again also Governor Schwarzenegger for his vision, his generosity, and his passion for establishing the Institute and for the unprecedented gathering of leaders from government, business, the media, and academia that the Institute has brought together in one room, in one place today. I can tell you that the governor is a true force of nature on and off the stage. I also want to thank uh, USC President Max Nikias for his remarkable leadership of the university, as well as Provost Elizabeth Garrett and my fellow deans, several of them whom are here with us today. And I want to acknowledge our Price School faculty for their innovative ideas hard work and dedication to scholarship for improving our world and for educating our remarkable students who are future leaders. And a special thanks also again to Professor Nancy Stout, Academic Director, and Bonnie Reese, Global Director of the Institute, for being such great and capable colleagues to work with in getting the Institute underway. We are all inspired by the Price School's extraordinary students. Many of them are in attendance today, including those enrolled in our new interdisciplinary course on leadership in a post-partisan age taught by uh, Nancy Stout. And I thank all of our students for their courage and for their determination to use their learning and an ability to make our world a better place. They are joined by fellow students from the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism from the USC Gould School of Law and the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And I extend a personal and warm welcome to all and each of you. <clears throat> Last but certainly not least, I thank the entire Price School staff for their unyielding support of me and the mission and purpose of the Price School we simply couldn't do what we do day in and day out without their special work. And especially today in planning and carrying out this symposium, we just couldn't do it without you. So uh, please thank all of the staff for their work in putting this symposium together. This morning's conversations with leaders from across the political spectrum cast valuable light on the importance of reaching across the partisan divide to solve seemingly intractable problems. We heard how solutions to global challenges often start locally. Our lunch discussion demonstrated the importance of this in the area of energy, the environment, and in climate change. Today's earlier sessions proved the value of the vision of the Schwarzenegger Institute to generate a new and better way to solve critical challenges, which is also what our school is about. The focus of the Schwarzenegger Institute on reaching across the partisan divide to provide sound policy based on evidence and analysis is especially important today. Congress and the President have clashed over the debt ceiling, over the provision for FEMA on natural disaster relief and now on the fiscal cliff looming this next January. What is contributing to this gridlock in the U.S. is the interaction between our a very important separation of powers system, which requires compromise and agreement to make it work, especially in divided government as we have today, and the partisan polarization gripping the country. Political scientists have developed a measure of partisan polarization in Congress from 1879 to today. The data show that the level of polarization in Congress today is the highest it has been in almost 100 years. Research also shows that the courts are polarized through partisanship, including the Supreme Court. 
So we need the kind of new ideas and possibilities being explored by our panelists today and being explored by the Schwarzenegger Institute to shift the way we solve our problems in our regions, our state, our nation, and the world. So by being here today, you have joined this process. You are part of advancing sound policy, not bad politics. The Price School is the ideal home for the Schwarzenegger Institute. Although the school was only named recently through the generosity of the Price Family Foundation gift in honor of the late Saul Price, the school was founded in 1929, making it one of the oldest of its kind in the country. We are also one of the most distinguished. We rank sixth among 266 public affairs schools nationwide. And our school has a simple but noble message and mission, and that is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities here and abroad. And we stand at the forefront of scholarship and research that address critical challenges facing government, society, and communities everywhere. To do that, we integrate the strategic, intellectual, and problem-solving resources of five independent yet related fields. These include urban planning and real estate development, public policy and public administration, and health management and policy. We are also home to 12 major research centers and institutes. And the Schwarzenegger Institute for State and Global Policy is our newest, and you can see how perfectly it fits our mission. The Schwarzenegger Institute also fits well with our, some of our other centers, including the John and Judith Brudrosian Center on Governance, the Leonard Schaefer Center on Health Policy and Economics, the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy, and our new Sol Price Center on Social Innovation. And I look forward to the possibility of the Schwarzenegger Institute collaborating with these other centers to make a difference in scholarship, on governance and public policy, and to make a difference in society. Now our panel this afternoon is focused on innovation. And universities have contributed significantly to innovation here and abroad. There are a few hundred students here today and 38,000 students at USC which possesses one of the strongest, most innovative, and entrepreneurial spirits of any university in the world. At the Price School, our faculty, students, and alumni both study the importance of innovation in, as well as develop innovative solutions to tackle critical policy, governance, and urban development issues. Faculty members in the USC Schaefer Center, for example, have conducted research that demonstrates the impact of innovation in the U.S. pharmaceutical industry on significant improvements in the health and well-being of the U.S. and Europe. And let me also just share a couple examples from our students. A Price doctoral student carried out a project that created a green and sustainable approach to help solve the home foreclosure crisis in the Inland Empire. It is now a PBS documentary called SOS, Sustaining Our Society, which will premiere in October. Students in our recent international practicum course in China developed a plan for val balancing the economics of global trade through major ports with localized environmental and societal impacts. And the organization, get this, for e the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, was so impressed with our students' work that they were invited to present their findings in Paris, Paris, France this fall. In the words of one of our uh, junior faculty members, the Price School, quote, has the type of environment where innovation occurs. It is a place where people care about ideas, each other, and the opportunity to do research that contributes to making life better. Now, inter innovation resides at the intersection of disciplines, but it also occurs at the confluence of disparate opinions and approaches represented on this stage throughout today by business, government, academic, and the media. And innovation also requires often a creative individual to propel change, such as Steve Jobs or George Lucas or Larry Page. This group of innovators also includes Sol Price, our school's namesake. 
who revolutionized the retail industry with the creation of FedMart, and then later the Price Club, which eventually became Costco. Indeed, the entertainment industry defines the term inno innovation, and we are really pleased to have some of the most prominent and innovative thinkers here today, adding their voices and views to ours. The overarching purpose of the innovation panel for this afternoon's session is to explore the intersection between public policy and innovation. One activity of the Institute will be to find innovators and help to train future innovators. Leaders of the media and entertainment industry are creating innovations that impact the world. Some of our greatest innovators come from there, and the media and entertainment in industries also have an impact on public culture and our political debate. Of course, as you know, this is a field upon which the governor has made a significant impact, working with talented artisans, both in the front of the camera and behind it. And now we are about to see a video, uh, unfortunately not a clip from Terminator 2 or The Expendables 2, I'm sorry, but one that highlights the ideas and ideals of innovation for the USC Schwarzenegger Institute. It is the story of innovation and of the tremendous progress made possible by visionary thinkers. Innovation and the will to pursue it have fueled the growth of this nation and it still singularly holds the key to our collective progress. So without further ado, please enjoy the video, The Power of the People and Innovation. Thanks. The history of the American economy is one of enormous progress, resulting from remarkable innovation. During our nation's formative years, the U.S. Constitution empowered Congress to create effective intellectual property rights, helping add what President Lincoln hailed the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Soon, Americans took part in the Industrial Revolution, an explosion of innovation, propelling a young country with democratic ideals to unprecedented economic heights, and providing a powerful example for other nations to follow. Innovation is ultimately tied to America's well-being and to our conception of the essential American character. The USC Schwarzenegger Institute is dedicated to searching out these people, organizations, businesses, entrepreneurs, and ideas, and bringing them together to allow their impact to multiply and to influence public policy so they may better navigate their way through the minefield that is discovery and innovation. The Institute will focus on state and global policy and will bring the best minds together from business, government, nonprofits, and academia, where together they'll work to develop real world sustainable solutions to the critical issues of our day. It is time that we combine the best of both ideologies into a new creative center. But this is a dynamic center that is not held captive by either the left or the right or the past. While one would think that innovation mostly comes from high-ranking government officials and political parties, history shows that innovation comes from individuals, entrepreneurs, and the community, influencing policy across local and global landscapes. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. But you don't have to be a famous innovator to change the world. The Schwarzenegger Institute will be seeking out, supporting, and cultivating the next generation of cutting-edge thinkers that are helping change the world. If America is to remain competitive in the 21st century marketplace, it must rely on its greatest asset, the innovative minds of its everyday people who believe a problem is just a solution waiting to be uncovered. 
That spirit of innovation is in our blood. It's in our hearts. It's in our souls. And our future depends on it. The USC Price School of Public Policy is proud to be the home of the Arnold Schwarzenegger Institute, dedicated to producing the greatest innovators of the next generation, who will make lasting contributions to public policy that will shape the future of our country and the world. Well, as you saw in the video, some of the biggest advances in our history derive from the innovative uh, spirit of individuals following a passion and working hard, resulting in positive systemic change. When applying this kind of innovative capital to advancing post-partisan public policy, the result can only be extraordinary. It's people like the governor and all of our students and every one of you in this room that fight on and power the engine of growth and change. And it's pe people like those who are on the after this afternoon's panel that have made a difference in the innovation engine that is our country. So it is now my privilege to introduce an important ambassador from the brave new world of social media. The growth of the internet and the resulting explosion of the social media have forever changed journalism and the pol uh, political debate. At the forefront of political reporters who successfully bridge traditional and new media is journalist Ben Smith. It's appropriate that Ben is conversant in different forms of media as he majored in ling linguistics at Yale where he graduated summa cum laude. Uh, and I should add, in the spirit of post-partisanship, we won't hold his alma mater against him. At the start of this year, Ben joined the influential social news outlet Feed, BuzzFeed as its editor-in-chief and in his words, did this to help build the first true social news organization. He writes a weekly column for Political where he formerly served as senior political writer. He has many traditional print journalism credits as well, which include the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the New York Post, and the New Republic, not to mention Slate, Legal Affairs, Reason, and In These Times. We are most pleased to have him here with us today to moderate our afternoon session. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage this afternoon's moderator, Ben Smith. Well, th thank, thank you all so much for, uh, for, for turning up for this. Thank you, thank you, Dean Knott. And it is really an honor to be here because anybody who's been covering presidential politics and policy in Washington and New York, which is what I've been doing for the last decade, kind of feels the entertainment industry as this enormous power in, you know, in, in politics, in public policy, but often as a kind of dark matter out there. Like we don't really fully understand how it's, how it's affecting and how it's changing what happens on the East Coast. But, um, we have a remarkable panel of really the central longtime leaders in that industry here to, to help explain that to me and, and to you. Um, we have one, uh, one, one regrets. Uh, G I'm told that Jim Cameron apologizes for being unable to join us today, but he is at his ranch and over the weekend got on a creative role with the next Avatar script, which I guess is as good an excuse as you get. Um, but uh, I guess without further ado, I'd like to bring out the panel. Um, and the the uh, the first the first person on here is, is familiar. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger um, is I guess is um, is 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 our host today, and he's asked me not to throw every question to him, so I will try not to. But um, you know, is, is is somebody who who really uniquely came from the entertainment industry into politics and public policy, and is is staying right at the intersection of those things with ex you know, extremely active in things like this and is, um, and it is starring in a new movie, Last Call, out in January from Lionsgate. Uh, the, the, next, the next person up is Ron Meyer. He's been the president of Universal since 1995. 
and, and he's someone who's who's seen the industry the industry weather this kind of remarkable technological and corporate transformation over the last over the last decade. He mentioned earlier Universal's had six owners since he's been since he's been there. Um, prior to joining Universal, he was president of a, the Creative Art Artists Agency, which he founded in 1975. Um, and I guess I'm going to try to keep these relatively short because there's, if there's anybody who doesn't need long introductions, it's, it's the people on this panel. Um, the next of whom is, is, um, is Brian, Brian Grazer, the, uh, the chairman of Imagine Entertainment. And, um, and he's the guy behind shows like 24, and he, and he won an Academy Award for the film A Beautiful Mind. Um, and he also there's a there's a great New Yorker profile of him which people might want to look up. But it said it said it said in there that he likes to make movies that are both hip and wholesome. But if there's a conflict between the two, wholesome will win. Uh, which I, I kind of love that. Uh, Jimmy Iovine, who's next up, is the chairman of. Uh, of He's the he's 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 got he's got a lot going on. He came up as, as an as an engineer for folks like John Lennon and Bruce Springsteen, a producer for U2. He's now the chairman of Interscope, Geffen A and M, and the chairman and founder of Beats by Dre, which uh, sort of a remarkable these headphones that are a remarkable marketing story as well as a technology story. He's wearing his subtle Beats by Dre hat to socially market to you if you can catch it on your your phones. Um, also, he's a mentor and American Idol. And, uh, and, the, and the final person out here is, is Rob Friedman, who, um, come on out. He's the, he's, he's the co-chairman of Lionsgate now, and I guess then that's the producer of, uh, of Governor Schwarzenegger's latest. But uh, a long career in the industry, he was the chief operating officer at Paramount and then created Summit Entertainment, which merged into Liongate, but and there the created the groundbreaking Twilight series. He's also very, very active in the Special Olympics movement and showed up here. I guess he doesn't still have them, but with a pile of folders from his Special Olympics board meeting. So um, yeah, without further ado, thank you, thank you guys so much for coming, and we'll we'll get rolling. <laughs> Did I forget something? Did I forget someone? Um, the, the topic of the panel is, is innovation, and I think the entertainment industry at this moment is sometimes seen not just as a source of innovation, just in the way filmmaking has changed so much in the digital revolution, but also sometimes as its victim. And I think you know, it's a, it's a, there's a studio system whose great successes are, are one of the big top-down stories sometimes of industry, you know, great minds like these figuring things out. You know, at a moment when, when the media environment is being disrupted by kids with iPhones producing hits on YouTube. And I guess I wondered, I'd throw this one to you first, sort of how you, how you navigate that transformation at, the, at a big studio. Well, first of all, anyone who's uh, buying our product, we're, we're content providers. So certainly anybody who's licensing, buying, and watching our product is a friend. So, you know, any of the new innovations really work, I think, to all of our advantage. I mean, the, the important part of it is that we get paid for it. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but assuming we, we are getting paid, and we, we mostly are getting paid for it, uh, I think it's a, it's a friend, not a foe. Yeah. And Jimmy, you, you, I think, you know, were one of the most successful music executives in weathering an industry that much more than, much more than film really got rocked by the rise of digital. And, and I, guess I, wonder, I guess I wonder, first of all, you know, whether there are lessons you learned that we're going to see playing out through film. Well, we did get hit first. And, um... What, what I found is that when 1999, the entire record industry was terrified of Silicon Valley. It was like some giant spaceship that came down and landed on us, you know, and uh, people getting music for free. So I was curious. I, I come from a music background, and so when I was an executive. So I said, I'm going to go talk to one of these guys. So I went to, uh, and it woke me up. I went to talk to Les Wardez, who was the, um, the, one of the founders of Intel. And I gave him a 20-minute speech on how this is impacting the, the, the people that are the low-salary people and the musicians and in, in investing in, a, in a artist repertoire and, you know, um, development. And he looked at me for 20 minutes. And he, it was a nice man. He said, Jimmy, that's so incredible. He said, but not every industry was made to last forever. 
So I got in my car and I said, uh, I called the chairman of Doug Mars, Doug Mar the chairman of Universal Music Group. He said, how'd it go? I said, we're fucked. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, anyway, and I, and I realized that at that moment that we had to do something to augment our business because the CD, I realized at that moment, was going away and that we couldn't just wait for the technology industry to do something to help us, right? And it's take, taken a very long time. I think the record business has been really slow at dealing with this problem. I think it did help the movie industry in seeing this. But, you know, we, uh, this, the basic facts are, in 1999, we were at $36 billion. Today, we're at $18 billion. We're not going to get back to $36 billion at a song at a time, selling on iTunes or something. We're going to have to have subscription. If subscription doesn't hold in the record business, Les Wadez was right. OK, and, and I, saw, I saw you nodding. Do you, are there, were there lessons that the film industry, I mean, I, I know people out here have never heard some of this language before. So um, I, I, won't, I won't repeat it. But, um, but I mean, you know, from, from the situation of the music industry, that we, we, were, uh, we were witnessing a car accident or a train wreck. And um, so we were on the uh, verge of, of bringing our product to the DVD market. Um, and as an industry, we took a, a, a bit of a pause to make sure that the DRMs and the protections that we needed for us to release our product to these new devices was at least as protective as we could make it at the time. And that was always sort of in counter uh, intent as Jimmy says, to the hardware industry, who did not want protections. They wanted it universally uh, able to be downloaded and, and consumed. <clears throat> so we waited a long time as an industry before we allowed our product to actually come out on DVD. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's still, piracy is a giant, giant issue for us as an industry. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, implemented all sorts of of activities to try to thwart pirates, et cetera, on an ongoing basis. But we absolutely learned from watching what happened at the music industry. And you took a fair amount of heat for, for, that, for that pause, I think. You, in the end, you feel like it, it was worth it? That for, you know, there were people saying that the movie industry is moving so slowly? Our ice cube is melting a lot slower than the music ice yeah. cube, so <laughs> yes. Or do you have? No, I, I, you know, I feel the same thing as Rob. And, and actually, Jimmy, 10 years ago, uh, started warning me as to, you know, created an alert as to what's going on in the music business, and then we're going to have the parallel implications in the movie business. And so I would go to, I'd participate in these anti-piracy um, meetings that were, I was a, I'm still a producer, but I was probably the only producer there, and they were all chairmen of studios, but we really couldn't and didn't do much. I mean, the, we just disbanded the, our, our group, and it never really... Uh, you know, we didn't do much about it, actually, but it, but it is affecting us. Yeah, it also, I mean, one of it also, uh, and that that shift has played into politics in a way that's for folks of, uh, folks covering the presidential campaigns have been very straightforward, which is that the the money and with it power have shifted from Los Angeles to Northern California, at least in part inside the Democratic Party. If you look at there was a leaked list of Barack Obama's bundlers floating around a couple of weeks ago, and if you ran through it. You'd see that there were, for the first time, I imagine, more technology executives than there were um, than there were studio executives or and film executives, which is, and I think you know, in some, and their their interests are not always aligned. There are fights over piracy laws that last year, this year, really, I think, for the first time, Silicon Valley won very convincingly. And I guess I wonder if you see that that power shift affecting affecting your industry. Other than, other than well, saving you a buck. Well, they, they certainly have a lot more money than we do. You know, they're, they're a, uh, uh, they've, they've, in a short period of time, have amassed a great fortune in Silicon Valley. Um, no, I think piracy is, the, is, of course, the major issue. And I think that, you know, we're, we are all in one form or another together looking for a solution for it and to it. But, uh, no, I, I, I don't feel affected by it. I think there's a lot of pluses, as we talked about. There's, I think there's, you know, there's certainly advantages in marketing. Uh, and, and, and communication with your audience, uh, good and bad. Um, but I think there's a lot of advantages to it. And I think we just have to find a way to all work together. I think at the moment, uh, we really are not a competitive business. We just have to find a way to be, have more of a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rob, do you see tension between, between the people who own the content and the people who own the platforms? No, I, I think as Ronnie said, I mean, we're in the content business and the, and 
the thing about new technology is it's always going to be starved for content. So it's an outlet for us, and 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 we're seeing you know different viewing habits on different devices based on age and experience, and and uh, so no, no, it's it, as as Ronnie says, it's it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, there are just certain issues that we don't have in common, one of them being piracy. Um, uh, I wasn't sure if you were, but um, I guess not one of the, I mean, one of the big, the big industries up there, and one of the things that's, I think, accelerated some of these changes is, is the abrupt rise of social media, which is you know, kind of where I live a lot of the time. And, you know, but, and again, if, you know, covering politics, you see that these political campaigns competing as, as producers of content, really, with people like me in the news business, with folks like you in the entertainment business, you know, competing on the same screen for the same, for the same time, you know, and increasingly, particularly in the case of the Obama campaign, just trying to produce really high quality content, sometimes with help from people out here. Um, and I guess I wonder, I am interested in how, the, how that, that shift towards social media, toward Facebook and Twitter, has affected the marketing of, of really everything you guys do. I mean, I think Beats by Dre is a is an interesting example of that. Well, to try to address both questions, the Silicon Valley, the technology industry, the platform industry, I think we're their solution, right? And we're starting to find that more and more. We are what differentiates them from each other. Verizon and AT&T, how do you pick a phone? Well, where does, where does my son's girlfriend live? That's how he picks his service provider, right? Well, that's not a lot, you know? So we, but if we had, see, technology companies usually, outside of Apple and maybe Morita with Sony when he founded it and Olga, are culturally inept, right? So they have these platforms, they have Twitter, uh, Facebook, but the content is provided by the consumer. The user-generated content, all of it, right? So now you go and you watch them on their own when they build Spotify and Rhapsody and Mog and all these things, and they are utilities, but they need culture. You, it's a service that has to project culture. So we have an enormous advantage. Take uh, YouTube with Google, right? And you take Apple, okay? And you look at Amazon and Microsoft. If we unite as an industry, we could favor one of those companies. And you know how much leverage we would have on each one of those companies? Take all the music videos off of YouTube right now and the user-generated content. What happens to YouTube? A lot of cranky people, right? So we have to be smart about this right now and not be intimidated and build our own platforms because we have what people watch. Yeah, Facebook is great because they have, their content is, is by all the users, all the people here. But these other places need content. And we have to know how to manage how we push it out. We just can't say, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll get 20 cents from YouTube, 20 cents from Apple, 30 cents from Microsoft, and that's our strategy. Well, that's not a strategy, you know? And we're gonna lose if we fight it like that, you know? There's no reason why uh, the record industry doesn't control uh, the, the user experience on our, our own videos. There's, because what happened was 70 years of saying, oh, someone else does that. So, you know, then you jump into Beats by, by Dr. Dre. I, I was just trying to prove a marketing concept with Beats. I said, you know, all these people are advertising everywhere, all these hardware companies, and they're so intimidating. I said, screw this. I'm going to make a piece of hardware, and I'm going to sell it through our culture. And I bet I can make a piece of hardware as good as they do, because they make all of their hard, or hardware in China, right? They're not creating it. They're the design guy. But everything's done. All that, most of the technology is done in China. You go down the street, it's like bazaars. Everybody, here's a new driver. Here's a new driver. Here's a new driver. You know, that's what it's like. You know, and so we built the best headphones in the world. It took us two years to make one, and then we marketed through our culture that we grew up on, that we built, that we control. And you know what? It worked. Yes, yeah, sir. Do you think that would have been? Do you think that would have been possible in an earlier media era, or was it just? Um, well, you know, it took being scared to death to to be motivated to do this, right? So I was looking at the record industry and saying, I, I remember actually I went to Ronnie Meyer's house one night, and one of the guys at his house has all these movie people there all the time. I'm one of the record guys that get invited, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I went there, and somebody said, "Gee, you know, it, it was 2002." He said. 
man, I'm really sorry about your business. It was like I was talking about my grandfather dying. <laughs> I was like, I said, man, that doesn't work for me. Oh, I used to be in the cool business. How'd I end up in this thing? You know, and I just said, okay, I'm going to do something else. So I, I, I called up Doug Morris. I said, Doug, you know what? If they're not going to pay for it right now to, 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 to buy our music, maybe I can figure out a way to charge them to, to listen to it. You know, and, that can be, and that's how the headphones started. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I see you applauding, but do you think there are, there are lessons from either from the successes or the mistakes of, of the music industry that you're, that you're taking to heart, other than the headphone thing? Well, I, I think what Robbie said is true. I think it's, you know, we're, we, you know the, the disadvantage the music business has is that uh, you can listen to that everywhere and you can download it quickly, and people are used to having gotten music for nothing. They listen to the radio, they've, they've always gotten music for, for no money or, or little money. And, uh, you know, you, a movie you have to concentrate on, you have to pay attention for that hour and 45 minutes or two hours or whatever the length of that film is. And downloading it take, is a little harder to do. So it's, it's a different kind of experience. Sure, there's a lot of lessons from it. Uh, unfortunately, as soon as we learn a lesson, uh, someone comes along and, and beats us at it uh, because it's much easier to steal it than to protect it. Um, so we have to get smarter about it. We have to find ways to, to make our product more entertaining, more accessible, more affordable, uh, and more interesting in many ways. And we're all working on doing that. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, but we have to find ways. Our audience is not really looking to steal it. Our audience, we have to, we have to just give them more reason to buy it. So to, to shift from the way the policies that and the innovations that have transformed the industry to the way the industry affects affects politics and policy more broadly, I think I'll sort of throw this one to you. There was a there was a cover story in New York Magazine not long ago, basically kind of an ode to Hollywood that concluded that it was by you know by a, lib a liberal writer it said we we liberals owe not a small measure of our success to the propaganda campaign of a tiny disproportionately influential cultural elite, basically thanking Hollywood for in their view kind of putting these conservative, ignoring conservative critics in the, in the 80s, going ahead with particularly pro-gay rights, pro-environmental programming. Um, and and in, in, in this guy's view, and you know, in, jo in Joe Biden's view, who cited Will and Grace as a central thing in changing, in changing um, the culture toward gay rights, re you know, really very effectively changing American politics, changing the way people see a lot of these issues. And I wonder, I mean, I wonder you, you've made movies and you know, in, in, in television programs that I mean, one that comes to mind is, is 24, which kind of got people used to the idea of a black president, actually. Um, you know, they have had this kind of change. And I wonder, you know, when you're, when you're producing this, what's, what's the thought process? Do you think through the impact on the culture on politics? Are you um, telling the story? I don't necessarily. On, on that particular thing we, we did, we thought, we thought through it. We thought uh, that it would be interesting to do that. It would be, could expand people's kind of neuro corridors and ability to sort of open, have an open-minded point of view about what they, you know, how they would vote in the future, how they'd see things in the future. So, I mean, on that particular one, it was political, but a lot of the movies that I do, or the ones that I like, are about uh, social or cultural issues, and I made sure, like, for example, on the Parenthood TV series, there's a kid with Asperger's syndrome, and in the same way with A Beautiful Mind, what I'm trying to do is, in that case, um, Destigmatize mental disability to the best ability that we can in a, in a message form, and at the same same time be entertaining, and engage people, and um, and so and also, you know, there's others exam other examples. Jimmy and I also produced Eight Mile together, and the point I think the point of view there was that we thought, I mean, Jimmy had a narrative, and I had a sort of manifesto, and my mine was that. I've kind of felt that hip hop was being perceived as a subculture, and I thought if we could find a way to unify and prove that it wasn't a subculture, that it was actually the culture, and have the establishment acknowledge it as the culture, and have it be introduced into the lexicon that way, it would interest me. Um, and so if there's any way to sort of elevate people's point of view or uh, culturally or artistically, that's something that I'm excited about doing. It, Jimmy, you're, you produced a, a concert in, in Philadelphia. The, I did. You produced a concert Ryan. Ryan, in Philadelphia. I went. I we went my, together, though. You went to, you I went saw to, a concert in Philadelphia. Well, that almost counts like yeah, producing it. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> With Jay-Z, you called, called Made in America. And I guess I wonder, 
I mean, was that, <laughs> was, I wonder if that was, I mean, which again, it was called Made in America, and again, yeah. it seemed like it, it was in part, it was part, it had some bilingual stuff. It seemed like it was about projecting a very specific vision of America. Well, look, Jimmy, actually, Jimmy, although I produced it with Jay-Z, <laughs> can speak to this very well, because he's been doing this for at least 15 different year, 15 years. I mean, I think what we were trying to do, and it was Jay's idea, was to, to show that, um, that we're going through a revolution right now, and that the revolution is about tearing the walls down, and that, um, and that everybody, you know, you don't go to record shops any longer and pick, go to the rap session section, or you don't go to hip hop, and you don't go to the rock and roll, that everything is accessible through the internet, and, and that all these kids are, there's a unification with all these kids, and they're creating their own message, and there aren't any walls. But I think, Jimmy, I'd love for you to speak to that. Well, you know, with, with hip hop, you know, in, in the 80s and then going into the 90s, I've noticed a lot of the children from that, uh, their parents are friends of mine from all over, from whether they're from Brooklyn or from France or whatever. And one common thing they always say to me is, is you know, there are a lot of less, there are many more, many fewer racial barriers than there were when we were kids. You know, and I'm not saying that hip hop is the only reason, but I think hip hop helped an entire generation communicate better and understand each other and accept each other better in a way that music never did before. You know, there was Motown and there was, but there was still white and black. When hip hop impacted, and one of the big things was that movie Eminem, you know, and, uh, and Dr. Dre and guys like that and Jay Z, is they brought together kids of all cultures in a way that was so unifying, but it was also, they did something together. It wasn't just listening to the music. There was a, there was a movement, it was an attitude, and, and I think it had a lot to do with it myself. And what you're seeing right now is, you're seeing the, dance, the electric dance um, a movement, along with hip hop, along with pop, and it's all kind of bringing the same kid to a festival. And you're seeing the communities in these festivals really become one. And it's a really incredible thing to watch. This show that Brian did was uh, had all different kind of kids at. You know, it was fantastic. So we had all, what we wanted to do is we wanted to have all different genres of music. But what I'd like to have the vertical be is have it through Jay-Z's perspective. And do, if we can ever create it, and that's going to be a lot of it, and it's going to be in post-production, and the concert itself will help inform this narrative, but is to do if there's such thing as a hip hop Amadeus and to see it through Jay Z's perspective. All right, stay, stay tuned. Um, stay tuned, we'll see. If we get to promote stuff, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, do you buy this? This or this like earlier thesis that, that, um, that liberals, that, that there's been kind of, that there's a Hollywood campaign on certain values issues that's really changed the country? And Trin turned it to the left, basically? No, I think there are plenty of, of, of uh, movies that are conservative and have wholesome values and, and sort of run the, the, the whole spectrum of, of, uh, of what we want from our society. I mean, I think that uh, many of us that are in, the, in the, the, the film and the music industry may have, you know, more sort of liberal cultural views of, of our own. Some yes, some no. The governor. But um, 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 on the on the sort of other, a little bit on the other side. So, and I think that we have a variety in what we try to produce and what we try to communicate. Um, and one, I mean, one of one of the issues I think that's all the films you know for decades have addressed and is 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 environmental issues, climate issues. And I was thinking about the Lorax actually. Um, I was when I was when I was reading up about it. Apparently, in 1990, the, the Lorax. If anybody doesn't know it, is this Dr. Seuss book about environmental depredation that, that, um, that you made into a, a, a film this year. Um, but in, in 1995, apparently, the National Wood Flooring Manufacturers Association published its own kind of rebuttal to the Lorax called, called the Truax about, um, about how good the logging industry is, is for forests. But I, wonder, I, mean, I guess I wonder what the sort of thought process is in, in, in producing a movie like that, how, much, in, in how deliberate it is. Well, it was delivered. Chris Melodandri, who, who's really inspired the making of that uh, Dr. Seuss book into a movie, uh, was very conscious environmentally. I mean, he certainly believed it was going to be commercial, and it was obviously very commercial. But he, he believed there was a message there, and it was a, a good, positive message. My wife was an environmentalist. 
saw it right away and she said the same thing. She said this is a movie that really can educate children uh, about the environment and about the, the dangers of, of not paying attention to what's going on in, in the global universe. And, and uh, so I, I think as a studio, we were very fortunate to be the recipient of it, but I, I would tell you that Chris Melodondry uh, really was the inspiration for, for bringing that to life. I'm not sure, you know, it's been, as you said, it's been around a long time, and, and those of us that were making Dr. Seuss uh, films out of his books, uh, frankly, never thought of doing that as a movie. So I, I, I wish as a studio we could take credit. We were smart enough to, to be in business with Chris and distribute it, but, but no one up to that time ever thought of optioning that. They had a cat in a hat and, and movies that we did, obviously. We did the you Grinch. Know, we did the Grinch. Down I'm saying we, the, uh, no, no, we, we, Mr. Seuss. No, so we, but we've, you know, we've all found ways to, to do, whether it be television or movies, Dr. Seuss related projects and none of us thought to do the Lorax. So as, as environmentally conscious as we are, I don't think any of us really had the inspiration to do it. There are a lot of very political Seuss books that occurs to me. I don't know if there are any others coming. The later Seuss gets very, very political. Um, Gov Governor, I, I mean, environmental issues are one where I think, you know, maybe despite Hollywood's best efforts, people who, are, who want to regulate carbon emissions are basically losing the, the war of public opinion right now. Or at least there was a, several years ago kind of a turn. And I wonder, you know, whether, is that, is that Hollywood's failure? I mean, somehow the culture changed. Well, first of all, I think uh, the power of films and television is enormous. I mean, it, I think it is much more powerful than politicians ever can be in convincing the, the voters out there of doing uh, something or going in a certain direction. I've seen that, for instance, uh, when we used to promote fitness. We, we, I was the chairman of the President's Council on Fitness, and they were debating the policy and what to do about the lunch programs and that every school should offer every child three times a week, 45 minute training and all this kind of stuff and how much money should be put aside and so on. And then all of a sudden came out the movie Saturday Night Fever yeah. and the disco and the John Travolta looking handsome with the white suit on and having all the girls and dancing. Around the globe, they opened up discos. There were more discos opened up within one year than anything you can imagine. Even in my village in Austria, yeah. there was only a population of 800, but there were two discos opened up <laughs> at the same year. So there were, there were the, the young folks, the young kids, dancing and dancing and dancing. And they figured out eventually the amount of people that were participating in dancing and, and how hip uh, disco dancing became, the amount of calories that were yeah. burned off with all the policy and all those debates they had in Washington couldn't even come close to of what the calorie count was what they burned off with all the disco. And at the same time, having a great time, government was not involved. No one told the kids you can only dance between six or eight or anything like that. No regulations whatsoever. Here's the limit what you can drink. None of that. They just went there and danced and burned more calories <laughs> than you could ever do through any kind of a physical fitness program. So it just shows you the power of just one movie, it's just one movie. And we have seen that over and over with these environmental causes that are being promoted. Uh, so I, I don't call it so much the left as much as, you know, I think Hollywood movies a lot of times talk about tolerance. You know, to tolerate, if you don't, if, 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 you know, if someone is gay, be tolerant. That's a person, it's not like you're promoting, you know, the gay lifestyle, you're just saying, hey, accept that person. If someone is an environmentalist, accept that person. If someone doesn't hate, uh, hate smoking, Accept that person. If someone smokes, also accept that person. You know, so let's be, a, a, you know, kind of open-minded. I think Hollywood has contributed a lot towards that. And so I, myself, like for instance, when it comes to the environment, the question you ask, one should not forget that at a time when you have economic downturn and when you have a recession, a worldwide recession, and the most important thing is to get a job, I think that will always be the number one thing with, in the political arena to talk about job creation rather than to talk about the environmental issues, even though eventually someone will figure it out that what California has done was that we created the jobs and also at the same time protected the environment because there is a, a, a total relationship between job creation and also between protecting the environment. I mean, if you think about 
of the solar plants. We're building the biggest solar plants in the world right now in the desert. Guess who is building that? Thousands and thousands of workers are working there and building that. So, I mean, these are, these are all projects that when you redo buildings to make them more energy efficient, there's endless amount of workers. When I ask, you know, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel when, she, uh, Merkel, when she came over from Germany and uh, on a trade mission, and I asked her, how did you get the unemployment rate, uh, improve your unemployment rate that quickly? She said, we immediately made a decision to weatherize all the homes in Germany. Well, that's energy uh, efficiency right there. And she put all the people back to work and the unemployment rate went from 5 down to 3%. So those are the kind of things that you can use. So there is a relationship to that with, 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 with the two. And do you think, I mean, I think, you know, I think people maybe thought the inconvenient truth at one point was like that movie. And Avatar, I think, and sometimes was supposed to be that movie. Do you think there is a kind of a big environmental movie that needs to, to change people's minds again? Do you think well, if the economy recovers? I think the inconvenient truth was a terrific project, but it is screaming loud for a sequel. You know, because the inconvenient truth has exposed the problem, but it has not really ever told us of what is the solution. And I think that's the next step what one has to do. And I think that's. I think people are waiting for that. I think it's a very important project. But I think that all of this, if it's Avatar or if it's Inconvenient Truth, or many other films, I think they're very good because I think that we have to, no matter how you put it, if you're on the left or if you're on the right, as I've said in my speech, uh, you know, and as I've said many times, people don't care if you're, re if you're breathing Republican air or Democratic air. People just want to breathe clean air. And people, when they want to go, when they go to the faucet, they want to turn on the water and know that that water is clean and it's not packed with, with uh, chemicals that will kill you down the line. And the groundwater is clean, so when you turn on the faucet, you have that, and you protect it in every way possible. We got to clean our environment no matter how we put it. Left or right, everyone is afraid of dying of cancer and all of those chemicals that we have out there in the ground and in the air, the particulate matter and all of those things will kill you. And that's why we have seen the cancer around this. Why when you saw Mayor Foster that they talk about it during lunchtime, about the things that they've done to reduce the pollution by 70%, it was because the people around that area were dying and were getting sick, much more so than in any other area. So it was very clear that pollution kills people. 100,000 people in the United States die every year because of pollution-related illnesses. It's inexcusable. I think our political leaders can do better. So they should forget about arguing about left or right or Democrat versus Republican. They should just solve the problem. End of story. Have you talked to Al Gore about the, uh, about the sequel? Is this in the works? No, no, I think that uh, it maybe needs different people again to jump in there and to do that. And, and we're going to be taking questions I, I'm from, from students only in, in a bit. So if uh, there'll be, I think, stationary microphones in the aisles if, uh, if students want to start thinking about questions. Um, but, but I guess continuing on the, on the sort of intersection of, of entertainment and public life, I wondered if, 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 if even your career you drew a straight line there, if you felt like that was if, if you felt like the governorship was a logical progression from, from the movies, and if the movies are a logical progression back? I don't know if it is a logical progression, but I, I think that if you at all, I, I mean, I feel maybe a little different than most people because as an immigrant, uh, when you receive with open arms in a place like that, and then you get all the opportunities, as soon as you have made it a little bit, you already start feeling like, well, how can I give something back? This place has given me everything. So I have always had that kind of need to give something back. And that's why I was involved in the President's Council on Physical Fitness. I was the chairman for Bush on that, uh, for Bush Senior. And then later on, I started getting really heavily involved in Special Olympics and in Best Buddies in those programs. And then later on, I started the after school programs and then passed the initiative in California, Prop 49, to get. $500 million more towards after school programs. You know, there was the debate also that where the conservatives said, well, you know, the parents should take care of the kids and all this. But then I made the fiscal argument that for every dollar we spend on an after school program, you, you get $3 back. It's a great investment because of the teenage pregnancy, the crime, juvenile crime, and the, putting them in jail and all this stuff costs much more. 
So then they, they endorsed it and they voted for it. So, I mean, so we have had great success, but I always felt like I want to give something back. So when the recall came up, and, uh, you know, this is talking about the power of the movie business, I mean, I don't think I would have ever won if I wouldn't have come from the movie business because that movie gave you the name recognition. And in politics, as much as in movies, you need the name recognition. It's very important. And you need to be likable. And luckily, I made those kind of movies that I was likable. Not that, mm-hmm. as the Terminator, maybe so much, but I mean, uh, crushing. Uh, uh, but I mean, even that, it was actually uh, very accepted. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so I think it was the movie industry that helped me to run for governor, to have that name recognition, to have the likability, and I won. You know, way ahead of, of my other opponents. And so I think there is a relationship that for me it was the greatest honor and the greatest pleasure to be able to step into that job and to uh, serve this state for seven years. And as I said, as soon as I'm finished, I will go back to the movie business. And uh, that's why, you know, Cincinnati, someone that ruled Rome 200 years before Christ, also was one of the great believers that he went in ruled and then as soon as he was finished he became a farmer again afterwards so I think that's cool to do that and this is what I do here is to just go back again and do what I did before and I'm having the greatest time being back in the movie business and I had a great time in Sacramento serving the people of California if if I may put you on the spot does it Rob does it does it change his identity as a star that he was governor of California or was it his movie stardom so much at such a higher level than political stardom that people don't even notice well, just uh, on the or on the name recognition issue, his new movie is called The Last Stand. Not the Last Stand. Call. What did I call it? The Last Call. Um, um, <laughs> the Last Stand. <laughs> opens in January. Um, <laughs> for my company. Um, Lionsgate. What was the date again? Uh, <laughs> January fifteenth. Title. Um, uh, the answer is the, the, the goodwill that that the governor built as a performer, as an actor, uh, carried through his, his governorship and continues to uh, carry on in his return to, uh, to the screen. So, so people, people kind of, audiences see it as kind of a continuous identity? I think they, they yes, I think they embrace the, the personality, they imper- the, the person and what he stands for, not only in life, but on screen as well, what he did for the state and, and what he does as a performer, and, and uh, the enjoyment and entertainment that he brings to the screen. You were, you were making the case in, earlier that you think Hollywood gives as much, gives as much away as, as any other industry, maybe more. Um, and you, you came, as I said, with, with the, uh, the folders from your Special Olympics board meeting. Right. And I wondered, I guess, you know, I mean, I think sometimes you look at, I mean, some, some of you guys are publicly traded companies, and there's an investment of time and money that I wonder, you know, how do you, how do you sort of justify that? Not, not just as doing good, you know, which is obviously always easy to sell, but how do you justify it as a, as a business? I think it is about doing good. And I, I think it's not just our companies that contribute, but it's uh, we as individuals, uh, everybody on, on this dais for sure, dedicates a lot of time and money and energy into uh, charitable work. Um, and, and public service, and and we as an industry have, uh, I think, our town, not just Hollywood, but but our community in Los Angeles, is probably you know one of the most giving communities uh, in the country, if not the world, uh, with a variety of, of charities and causes, um, and I believe that it's just a spirit that we have uh, have enjoyed in our community and and our industry for sure. Um, uh, does give back and, and does, I think, appreciate the interaction with our, uh, with our uh, uh, consumers um, and with the people around us. And I think that it's, uh, it's instilled in us. Uh, it was instilled in me early on in my corporate career, and I carry through and I try to instill it in our, our uh, employees, um, as I'm sure uh, everybody on this panel has. And I guess, and the, and the special, why the Special Olympics in particular for you? Uh, the Special Olympics was introduced to me in, actually in the movie business in 1978 when we had a, a world premiere for the benefit of the Special Olympics of Superman uh, in the Jimmy Carter administration, and that's when I first met Eunice Kennedy Shriver, and she introduced me to uh, the Special Olympics movement. It just coincidentally, uh, I grew up as a, as a young boy in the south in a small southern town 
uh, with a with a Down syndrome uh, boy, uh, uh, so intellectually challenged, who you know uh, was far from included included in everyday activities, but he was one of our sort of friends and uh, one of our pals. So um, and then you cut to twenty years later, twenty five years later, and and meeting uh, Mrs. Shriver and having her talk to me about the program. So I became uh, first involved then, and then uh, later on in, uh, in uh, uh, 1990, uh, Maria asked me to join the Southern California uh, Board of Special Olympics. So I've been involved ever since. And, and I'm currently involved, I'm the chairman of the board of the World Summer Games, which are coming to Los Angeles in 2015. It's the single biggest sporting event in the world. Over 7,000 athletes will be here. Um, yeah. Not since, thank you, thank you. Not since the uh, 84 Olympics will there be an event taking place in Los Angeles of this size and importance, so. Oh. The, um, and before, before we get to the questions, um, you, you, you mentioned this in passing before, but I think one of the, probably the biggest transformations that Hollywood has helped change in America over the last decade or two is, is the portrayal of the family. And, and, I, and I, you had a really interesting take on this. I mean, and you mentioned that in, in the, in, not in the film, but in the TV series Parenthood, there's this kid with Asperger's, and it's, it's it sort of, I don't know, it seems like it's a more complicated family than it used to be, really anywhere you look, but that's certainly an example. If you look at the film and at the series, it's just a much more diverse, complicated family. Well, I mean, I mean, this all, I mean, I've done, a, many of my movies deal with family, whether it's Friday Night Lights, or whether it's Parenthood, or the Parenthood TV series, or even Arrested Development. They all deal with some sort of what looks to be a family unit that makes sense, but then underneath it there's normal dysfunctionality. And, you know, Arrested Development goes is very extreme and is very outrageous. And in the TV, in the, in the movie Parenthood and in the TV series Parenthood, we try to pick real things that happen within family units that uh, are crises for the family that you wouldn't expect. And, it started off in the, with the movie that looked like the perfect family, but underneath it, you see what the, what, what, you know, what the rules of family really are about and when you deal, and when you deal with issues. And the, one of the issues that we chose for our TV series, which actually Jason Kadem created, and he writes every episode, he and I also share um, the same issue. I have a son that has Asperger's, he too has a son that has Asperger's, and we now have a character in the series. And, um, you get to, you know, do real life ex experiences and and express them through the series. And for example, this week I looked at a rough cut that my son Riley actually experienced when he was going to a normal public school, Malibu High, and I found the perfect school outside of Malibu High for him to go go to, um, which took about ten years to figure out. And on one day I just said, Hey, listen, I'd like you to go to this particular school, and I think you're gonna really enjoy it, because he was sort of facing a lot of difficulties with it, with his um, disability. And he said, no, no, I decided what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run for office. I said, well, what office do you think you're gonna run for? I was thinking, you know, treasurer, secretary, I'm gonna run for student body president, and his class was 800 kids. And, you know, the best and the brightest smarty, smart kids, and he ended up winning. And he ended up so, because <laughs> it was, a, it was the, the most, you know, the most emotional uh, moment that I'd, I'd had uh, ever, perhaps, because um, it, it was life-changing to him. It affected his self-image in a way that was so profound. And I let him stay, of course, and serve as president of Malibu High. And it was just, it was something... It was just something that ch changed his life, and now we were able to do an episode that almost replicates that Riley's experience. And you get to affect people, and you get to help destigmatize mental disability and empower kids that you, you kids and parents that need understanding. And um, to the extent that I'm able to do it, the extent, and look, other artists do this all the time. You find a cause, you find a subject. It's either personal or something you really care about or it's happening to your family. And you get to express it. And you get to find a narrative or a vehicle. And in the case of A Beautiful Mind, it wasn't even John Nash. I found a different story. It was about Michael Lauder. But Michael Lauder had a tragedy in his life, the schizophrenic. And I then, to service the same goal, then found John Nash. So 
artists are doing this all the time. And uh, I've just been fortunate that I've been able to express it in some of my television series and movies. Do you, do you think in the, in the sort of transformation of the way families are portrayed in TV and film, the, the you know, interracial couples, gay couples becoming really, un, you know, no surprise, is that something where Hollywood has, has led the culture or followed it? Oh, I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, we did Brokeback Mountain. And I mean, people thought, why would you make a movie about two men and their relationship in, in such a, a kind of serious, poignant way? And, you know, we, we believed that it was the right story to tell at the right time. It, it, it obviously turned out to be a huge success and, and, uh, and, and treated importantly. But I think films like that, as, as Brian said, I think, you know, you, you do those kind of movies. And I think it, 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 it's great when it works. But I think they, but we certainly do everything. I think all of us have been through this before. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't work. But I think we're, we all care about doing something that makes a, a social impact of some kind, whether it do with a family or whether it does with events. I mean, we, you know, uh, for us, I think for me, the most important film I was ever involved was United 93. Uh, uh, a lot of people were involved in making that film, but it was a story that was important to tell, and it was about heroism and what people can do in the worst of circumstances and you know I think we have a chance as an industry not always because we, we in order for us to come back and fight another day we've got to make hits um, but uh, you have a chance to, to tell a story that can to make an impact I think on society and on and the way people think and feel so yeah I think that you know hopefully we do more positive than negative but unfortunately in, in, a, in a business of trying to entertain people uh, you probably get a little of both. And United 93 was a great movie that did well. It was not probably the biggest hit you've ever made. But it, I mean, but it, you, there's another kind of satisfaction you get from it? Oh, it, it, the satisfaction is, is beyond belief. I mean, it, uh, I think it's such an important film. And it, it really makes you proud to be an American and proud of what people can do and, uh, in the very worst of circumstances. Um, it, it was a success, and, and that's the, the, the nice part about it. But when we, we agreed to make that film, it really was made because it it was a story that needed to be told, and told in the right way with the right filmmaker and the right production company. And so, yeah, I think that when when a moment, when something like that works, it's so, obviously you all take great pride in and, and feel quite good about it. And this is maybe more a question about Brokeback, but I mean, maybe in my impression, though, is that when when you when you took over in '95, there was still a vocal conservative movement that would occasionally picket theaters. There was there were you know morality groups that were really after Hollywood, that strikes me as having basically faded. And I wonder, is, is there less political risk than there used to be in doing these things? Is there less heat around it? Well, you never know what's going to incite, you know, a, a politician or, or public outrage. You, you do your best not to uh, uh, cause that kind of controversy, but on occasion you do. I mean, go back to, I mean, thinking about films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Uh, you know, those are, I think those are really, Films like that were really important in, in it wasn't one of ours, but, it, but a film like that is hugely important in shaping opinions of society and how people feel and think in that. And Schindler's List, movies like that, make a, educate people in a way they would never have been educated before without seeing that film or seeing a film like that. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we, I think all of us as an industry take great pride when you're able to, to, make a difference and make money at the same time. Obviously, we're in the business of making money and you, you have to be very concerned about doing that. But, you know, I think we're all looking to be as responsible as we can. And sometimes it doesn't come out that way. And, uh, and there are different degrees of what's responsible and what isn't. Do you think that Hollywood has kind of won the culture wars from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner to Brokeback Mountain? God, that's such a broad statement. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we've, we've won the culture war, but I think that we continuously try and I think as, you know, I think so as a country, we've come such a long ways. I mean, I, I have, I have uh, four children, and I, I try to explain to them what took place in the Orville Faubus South uh, as, we were, as we were all growing up, and, and how extraordinary segregation was, what a horrible, horrible thing it was. And it was in our lifetime. It's not like this was 100 years ago. This was, uh, you know, 45 years ago. I mean, it's a pretty extraordinary thing when you think about it. And, you know, I think all of us, you know, as a nation, try to find ways to educate our, our families, our children about what 
the horrors have happened in, 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 in different times in our life. But that was, that was in America. That was in a foreign country. Um, and I think we as, as filmmakers, as distributors, exhibitors, financiers, you know, have, a, have an obligation and an opportunity to, to tell those stories. And hopefully we make a difference. Hollywood has won, or is winning, is losing. I think that, it's simplistic. I think that Hollywood. I, mean, I always was proud of our industry simply because, I mean, there's no one that is out there raising more money for various different causes and charities than Hollywood. I mean, think about it. I mean, you see, for instance, uh, you know, with 9/11 when it happened. I mean, the, Hollywood was the first ones to jump in and to start raising money uh, for the Twin Tower Fund. I mean, there's an earthquake somewhere. They're the first ones to have a fundraiser and raise, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I mean, you think about the whole campaign against AIDS, and uh, you know, Elizabeth Taylor and uh, you know, Magic Johnson and uh, uh, Elton John and all these people, you know, from entertainment, from music, coming together and you know, having fundraisers and again raising endless amount. Of, I mean, really huge amount of money. So Hollywood has, for many, many causes and many, many charities been always the most generous when it comes to you know, putting money up and, and supporting various different causes. So I think that, that the rest of the world should look at this community of how actively they're involved in the political arena, if it is you know, putting money up and having fundraisers and stuff like that, or being involved in policy issues, or being involved in charitable and non-for-profit issues and stuff like that. So it's, it's a, a place one can be proud of. Yeah, well, I, I would just add to that, I mean, you know, throughout history, culture has always been, uh, uh, you know, has, has changed the, the way the populations have thought, and we're just a continuation of that between music and literature and film. Um, we continue to try to educate and, and uh, inform and, and change attitudes. Um, I, I think we're probably just about 15 minutes left, and we're, there's a microphone over there and over there, and if folks have questions, you can head over there. I think in, while, while you do, I'll just take a and a moderator's privilege to, to ask to ask Ron about some stuff that's been in the news lately. And I mean, you've been you've been you've been at Universal for quite a while, and there's been a bit of chatter lately that you might be retiring. And I figured I would ask you directly about it. Uh, I, 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 um, well, no, it's okay. I, I mean, I, no, I have no, I wouldn't know what to do retiring. So no, I have no plans to retire. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I like what I'm doing, and I. I as long as they have me, I intend to stay. So I'm, no, thank you for asking, but I'm not uh, retiring. Get used to him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, lots, lots of folks. Let's start over there, and I think we probably have time for three or four questions. Yeah. Well, well first of all, I just want to thank all of you for coming. This is such a wonderful opportunity for us students to really hear from people who are so influential in the industries that you're in. Um, my question was for Mr. Jimmy Iveen. I know that you worked exclusively with Bruce Springsteen. Obviously, he's on your shirt today. Um, I know Mr. Springsteen talks a lot about the disconnect between American, the American dream and American reality. I was curious, in your opinion, if this is something that you find has further politicized Americans to where they feel they need to pick an extreme to bridge that gap between what they are promised in the sense of American dream and what their American actuality is, which is obviously an economic uh, depressed time at the moment. And just generally, your experiences. Yeah, are you, are you uh, asking me if, if Bruce Springsteen himself is um, uh, um, diverse, uh, dividing people? Is that what you're asking? I'm sorry. I should clarify. I know Mr. Springsteen talks about how American dream is often not met with the American actuality, how there's a divide between what we are, in a sense, promised and what we actually are able to achieve a lot of times. And I'm curious to know if you believe that this is further politicizing America, because I know there's a lot of discussion of extreme left and extreme right and not being able to come together and find the in-between. And I'm wondering if that has been well, your experience. Well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for Bruce. You know, I worked with him for you know, a long, very, very long time. We're very good friends. But a lot about what he sings about throughout, you know, when he was, whether it be his early albums like Born to Run, or a wrecking ball today, you know, it's it's, it's 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 a very similar character that's gone through life with him. You know, it's either people he knows or just overall general America. And it, it's true that it's harder today than it was for my generation. 
you know, but there are some opportunities. But I think that, I think Bruce, Bruce is a very unique character. And he's a real life force, you know, and you can always learn a lot by watching him and listening to him. And he is a working guy. You know, when I first met him, I, he was broke, living in a surfboard factory. And um, the, most, the most impressive thing about him, which I've always tried to emulate ever since, uh, was I've never been able to quite get there. He was very un he was completely uncompromising. There was nothing that anyone had that he wanted to compromise that would make him compromise his art or his position, you know. And um, he's that guy. So I don't. I mean, I just think I just think that America is at a, like everyone else believes is that most people believe is at a crossroads right now. And uh, if you go to other countries, especially in Asian stuff and importing all their students to make to, to get their to get educated here and exporting all the brain power out right after that I think it's a real problem you know and um, but nothing I can do about that except try to make great music and great headphones <laughs> next question please uh, I really enjoy the conversation you were having about the entertainment industry as it relates to the technology industry because I come from an industry that's sort of a marriage of both, the video game industry. Um, and I, I study at the School of Cinematic Arts, but my creative medium is video games. So my question for you in the, the topic of innovation and uh, you know, in the spirit of all the great information sharing that you all obviously do between the film industry and the music industry and the creative collaborations like Made in America is, um, you know, where do you think we are? What do you think are the big challenges in trying to work more together uh, than you know, the current state of affairs is where we're all trying to figure out how to work together and there's uh, things like games based on movies and movies based on games, but getting closer to what it, it seems like you all have between the film and music industry. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. This is sounded like you, I'm Brian. Not, I'm not sure. It sounded what like me because you said game. because you said made in America. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like you. <laughs> I think you should dive in. But basically, <laughs> um, you know, f for me, you know, I think that um, I'm learning that there, are, you know, made in America once again was a manifesto that was created by Jay Z, and I'm, you know, Ron Howard and I are, were in service of his idea. Um, and his two day, um, you know, two days that he filled, you know, this, if, you know, created this concert in Philadelphia. And what we wanted to do was just film it and turn it into something that would further project his belief system, which is, you know, you've got black kids with skateboards and Chinese kids with berets, and you've got everyone is just doing their own thing. And it's like, we want to just participate in his movement because we think that's what's going on. There aren't any barriers and you can access any narrative from any location on the internet and to, to you know to find to help nurture that into a bigger platform is just something that i think I, that's what i'm going to try to do try to find that alignment and and i'm i'm sure i mean you should speak to it jimmy i think this is your world thanks Brian. <laughs> i mean now the question down for me a little I, bit i'm interested <laughs> if, if if any of you folks see I mean, I think part of the question is whether the video game industry deserves to be kind of taken seriously as an artistic partner to some of what you guys do, which, and... and well, I think they are. Yeah, I, I mean, would, I think I where, where, where possible and where applicable, you know, uh, again, success in, in all businesses is really about branding and brand identity and, and uh, any, any opportunity you have from a marketing perspective to take advantage of a successful brand uh, and to try to bring it into a new medium to uh, to uh, to create new product is something that we always try to do. Uh, we try constantly to take you know the video game industry and to work closely with them to bring you know their vision and their creativity to to our uh, screens and to our medium. So the answer is yes. Sometimes we do it well. Sometimes we don't. You're up. Thank you. Hi. Um, since the music and movie industries are so incredibly prevalent today, do you think that it would be effective to implement mandatory courses, just as math, science, English, or history, in throughout high schools, middle schools, even elementary schools, to educate students on the lessons behind music and film, other than jamming to music and watching a movie with your boyfriend? I actually, it's funny you bring that up, because I've been talking to a lot of people about that recently. 
I think that what's being taught in schools in music right now, uh, a lot of it's irrelevant. None of them are learning or teaching people how to get into the modern record industry, all the problems they have in the industry. And it's funny, I was um, sitting next to the president of your school today at lunch, I had the honor of sitting next to him, and I was talking to him about this a little bit. Because usually you go into a music course and they're teach teaching you jazz chords, which is really nice, you know? But it has nothing to do with actually what musicians do today. Musicians, they play the guitar, they, they program drums, they're DJs, but they also completely understand the communication of music, how to communicate it to their audience. And I don't think in college or any schools, any of that is being taught. I mean, I think I've been to, you know, the New York, NYU and all this stuff, and none of it approaches the modern record business for the modern musician. So you have, a, you have DJs going out completely on their own, creating their own, own audience without a record company, without any of the things that we're aware of, because they had to grow another arm in order to, to evolve and to create their own business. Now they get paid $200,000 a night, and they've never had a record out. So no one is teaching the modern record business with both the greatness of it and the problems of it. So I think um, there's time for a new curriculum in, in, in music, and um, I'm very interested in this. Thank you. We have time for, for a couple more. Um, next question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we touched briefly on the effect of social media for your respective um, industries. We're, you know, we'll, we're seeing YouTube, how stars are coming out of their living rooms, and you know, Korean pop stars are shooting to the you know, top of American, uh, American charts. Um, just just via video on YouTube, and I was wondering if you guys could just discuss um, the pros and cons of YouTube on your industries and how it's actually changing how you guys are doing business. I'm not, I'm not sure that that it's just YouTube. I think that all of the sort of social media is having an effect on on our basic business. I mean, I, I use we had a, a, a TED was our film, and uh, Seth MacFarlane had. A, a million followers before Ted ever came out. We we were able to, to our marketing group was able to sort of along with Seth, treat Ted as his own personality. First, he became sort of a personality, and then ultimately became a star through, whether it became through uh, Facebook or whether it was through uh, Twitter. He had his own uh, Ted had his own uh, 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 a blog, and so before the film came out, we were able to create this personality uh, that really never existed before. And so when, when the movie came out, he had as much, Ted had as much recognition as Brad Pitt. Um, uh, and that's the reality of it. So, so I think all of social media has, has a real impact on how we market things and how we sell our product. I'm not sure, you know, that, but when you see, I watched, I, I forget who it was, Jimmy, you would tell me, I, I watched a, a, a documentary, it was Justin Bieber who was discovered on YouTube. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was pretty extraordinary. I mean, I saw a, a, a young agent who saw this kid on YouTube and went and convinced his mother to let him sign him. Right. I think that's just, it's fantastic. And, and when we were all growing up in the business, there was nothing like that ever existed. Those opportunities never But those really are the benefits that the artist community is receiving. But on the other hand, you have giant corporations. We're all, we're all self-serving as the next guy, next guy, I guess. But what a company like YouTube does, which is interesting, is they have, they have user-generated content, which is they take the song, they put up a lyric video, and they hide behind safe harbor laws, like they're just in the middle, they're technology, they don't understand what's really going on. And a lot of piracy, and those musicians that you're talking about, like Justin Bieber, are selling one-tenth of the records that they do because after his record comes out, it goes up on YouTube or on any other blogs, and it gets listened to for free without, so now, but the record industry has a lot, and the movie industry has a lot of leverage. I'll give you an example. While we were hit with piracy, we were also hit with the degradation of sound of our music. We spent millions of dollars, and musicians spent thousands of hours making music sound powerful. To, to, you know, the, different, the conduit for emotion with music is sound. And so we had bad MP3s all over these websites, then coupled by, or compounded by the little earbud that came with the iPod, and then 
computers that were made for talk, most computers, their speakers are facing down at the tabletop. It took me three years to convince one computer company to face the speakers up. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's because uh, they don't care. They say people don't care about sound. So that's kind of why we started an audio movement. But what I really tried to prove is how much influence we really have over the tech business. I don't know if you noticed this, but a month ago, Apple just one of their ads is now our earbuds sound better than they did. That's directly responsible because we put cultural pressure on them. We put cultural pressure on HP. HP backed us, and we made their computers sound better. Now Dell's advertising is saying, our computers sound better. And people are starting to do more than this, but face their speakers toward the listener. So you know, we have a lot of influence over a lot of these tech companies. And we should take advantage of that. And we should use that to make the experience for the consumer better. And help the artists really realize their dreams. I questioned that you asked me before about Bruce Springsteen. Well, you know, there's, there's thousands of musicians that are not realizing their dreams right now because they're being caught up in this crazy uh, technology cultural war. And they're, 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 they're not getting paid. So that's why DJs exist today. They said, OK, screw that. I'm going to go make my own career over here. But we have a lot of influence of people up, up here and, and in, the, in the community of, of, the, of the arts. We can, we can get the technology companies to do whatever we want. Tomorrow, we could shut YouTube. The user can use it tomorrow, no, January, to be frank. We could stop giving them user generated content like that. But the record industry doesn't have the guts to do it yet. Well, you know why? Because YouTube will come, Google will come. September and write a gigantic advance. Everyone will say, oh, I'm going to make my numbers this year, so I'll take the advance. It's kiting. So, you know, we have a lot of juice in this area, and we should take it. And didn't we'll shut them down, but get them to play ball so everyone in the ecosystem gets taken care of. I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're out of time. You'll have to uh, tweet your questions at these guys <laughs> after, <laughs> af afterward. Um, the, uh, the Institute's directors, Bonnie Reese and Nancy Stadt, are going to come up just, just for a quick minute. But thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you guys for participating. Thank you. I just want to, Nancy and I just want to thank everyone that was here for our inaugural symposium, the launch of our Institute. Uh, and we hope that we've teased you with the kind of brilliant leaders we're going to bring together at the Institute to explore public policy. Uh, from the private sector, innovators like these great leaders that you heard from today, and political leaders. And like Arnold says, it doesn't matter what their political persuasion or what their philosophy, we will bring the best and brightest people from the private and public sectors together to explore these solutions. Nancy? Now I'd like to invite Governor Schwarzenegger, my new colleague, Professor Schwarzenegger, up to join for us. The final comments. To, to close the day, Governor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to again uh, thank um, everyone that was involved in putting this event together. I want to thank them because uh, it takes a lot of people to put something like this together. I want to thank also the press for participating here today. I especially want to thank the panelists again. Uh, I thank you guys. I know you're very busy running your companies and uh, under a lot of pressure all the time. Uh, to produce the grossest notice, but you still took time out for something very important. I think that this is what the Schwarzenegger Institute is all about, is to expose the students to the best of the best, doesn't matter what the party affiliation is, and uh, to inspire them and to go in a certain direction to become great leaders in the future. So I want to thank, thank each and every one of you for, the, for your participation. And I want to thank all of you also for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you.